Welcome everyone to Centerpoint Church. My name is John and I have the honor of being one of the pastors here. It is wonderful to be with you, to get to share today as we continue our series, To Be or Not to Be Like Jesus. And as I was thinking about today's message, I was reminded of a time when I was around seven years old and my father and mother took us to the Bronx Zoo. And I don't remember what we saw there. You know, it could have been that the animals were so far away that they might as well have been stuffed animals. Uh, I don't remember what we got from the gift shop. I probably lost it shortly thereafter. Um, All that I remember, and as I was talking to my family this week, all that we kind of remember collectively were, were two things. One was that it was so incredibly hot. Like, it was the middle of the summer, the midsummer heat. It was just, it was so intense that we were just dying. And secondly, that all any concession stand on the entire grounds of the Bronx Zoo had to sell for refreshment was Sprite. (laughs) Now, Sprite at the time was advertised as the thirst quencher, but what was my experience, my family's experience, was that after we drank Sprite, who's probably going to sue us for saying this, but after we drank Sprite, about five minutes later, we were suddenly more thirsty than we were beforehand. And we found ourselves just going from concession stand to concession stand saying, do you have any Sprite left? <laughs> I don't know how much it cost my family to go to the Bronx Zoo that day, but I know that whatever it was, we spent more in cans of Sprite. The reality is that even though it advertised itself as the thirst quencher, it didn't actually satisfy And in our culture, there are a lot of things that promise satisfaction, a lot of things that promise to satisfy the hunger within us, satisfy the thirst that we all have, and yet don't. Maybe it's success, that if you get a certain level of success, that suddenly now you'll feel satisfied, or maybe a certain number of friends or relationships or likes on social media, or a certain level of money, or a style of house, or a certain material thing, that then suddenly you'll be satisfied, and yet we've found that not to be the case. And so there's the lie of more, which comes up next that says, you know what you need is you need more of what's not working. And if you had more of that, more success, more money, more relationships, then you would be satisfied. But we have to look no further than our celebrities, our cultural heroes, to see that that's not the case. I remember a Tom Brady interview from years ago after he'd won his third Super Bowl, And he said, uh, there's got to be something more. And the interviewer was surprised by this. He said, well, well, what is that? You've won three Super Bowls. You've got all these things. You've got all these fame and and all this fortune. What what is it? And he said, I don't know. Uh, Billie Eilish, the cultural pop sensation, she's recently quoted as saying, fame is trash. They asked her how much of her life she enjoyed. She said, I can tell you that 50% of my life I'm miserable. This is somebody who is worldwide famous, wealth, popularity, status, and that's what they say. More of what isn't working isn't going to work. So what's going to satisfy? That's today's question. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. We've been in this series where we're looking at the most famous sermon in the world, and we're looking at the introduction to that sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And we're in the Beatitudes, and in weeks one and two, it was kind of a two-part series in and of itself, because weeks one and two are connected, they're tied together. Week one, we talked about how blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Week two is blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And what we talked about was how the way into right relationship with God is by recognizing that we are spiritual beggars that we are bankrupt spiritually, and that our only hope is to mourn our sin and throw ourselves on his mercy. And when we do that, we find ourselves comforted, and we find ourselves invited into the kingdom of heaven. Last week, we looked at how that changes the way that we look at our possessions, our power, and our positions, that they're not about ourselves anymore, but they're actually submitted and surrendered to God. And today's passage we're going to look at is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, for they will be satisfied. What ultimately satisfies? Righteousness. Righteousness is what satisfies the deepest cravings that we have. Righteousness following after God. And so when I was thinking about it this week, I was looking up that word righteousness, and I looked up in a couple different dictionaries, and I, I found a lot of definitions that weren't super helpful. Uh, but thankfully, we've got a wonderful teaching team here that we rely on, and so we kind of put together this definition of righteousness 
that we're going to be using throughout this message, and I hope is a uh, help to you. Uh, righteousness is living in line with God's view of how the world should work. It's living in line with God's view of how the world should work. And so I want to do a quick aside and just say that right from the outset, that what we're talking about here is the righteousness that God calls us to, not the righteousness that God gives us in Christ. What we are talking about today is a result of salvation, the righteousness that results from being saved, not the requirement for salvation. It is the product of being saved by grace. It is not the prerequisite for it. And so the first clarification I want to make is just that we're, we're not talking about what's called positional righteousness. Christ died for my sins and for yours, and when we embrace that gift, we are holy and blameless and beyond reproach in heaven before God for all eternity. That's what it says in Colossians 1. The righteousness we're talking about is the righteousness in this life. And I'll tell you that the mistake that I made, and one of the fascinating things about this passage as I was studying it, was that it didn't exactly mean all of what I thought it meant. Um, maybe it's the fact that I am born in the West, that I always viewed this passage as meaning my individual righteousness. So when I heard, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, it means blessed are those who hunger and thirst to spend quiet time with God. Uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for fasting. Blessed are those, that's, that's a pun intended. Uh, that, blessed are those who <laughs> hunger and thirst for journaling. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for silence and solitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for study and for meditation and for prayer. I thought it meant only those things. And it certainly is those things. That's what righteous is. That's what God's desire is for me to do that and to spend time with him and to let him change me from the inside out and live in line with the way that he wants me to live. It's certainly that. But in studying this passage, I, I've, I've learned and I've seen that it's not just that. You see, righteousness is not just individual. It's interpersonal. It's, it's not just individual, it's interpersonal. And that's something I wish I could have understood uh, as I, I started getting into the faith about 20 years ago. I, I was so focused on my personal relationship with God that I was so less concerned with everything that was going on around me. But this is what Christ is calling us to. He's calling us to a righteousness that is individual, yes, but also interpersonal. Now, I know that when I talk about things like interpersonal righteousness or righteousness within society, that there are probably, for many of us, a lot of emotions and thoughts and opinions that rise up. And so what I want to do is I want to spend some time letting Jesus speak this meaning so that way you don't think that I'm trying to impose my thoughts onto the text. So here's a couple of scenarios with Jesus that I think are very helpful for us to understand. In Matthew 22, Jesus is asked by uh, the Pharisees, one of the Pharisees, what is the greatest commandment? And the Pharisees are kind of like the villains of the Gospels. Not all of them, but the majority of them. And so this is a question that's being asked to try and make Jesus look like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Jesus responds, this is Matthew 22, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 6. It's called the Shema. It's a prayer that the Jewish people would pray on a daily basis. But then he says something very interesting. He says, the second is like it. But wait a minute. This guy just asked for the top commandment. He just asked for the number one commandment. And yet Jesus is saying, you need this to consider as well. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's quoting from Leviticus 19. And so when asked, what is the greatest commandment to follow, Christ gives one that is individual as well as interpersonal. He re reiterates this in Matthew chapter 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, in all things, treat others the way that you want to be treated, for this is the law and the prophets. We think about the passage that says, what does God require of you, O mortal, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. But my favorite one is in Matthew chapter 5. It's right after the end of kind of the Beatitudes. Jesus, uh, he's teaching his disciples, and this is what he says. Um, he says, unless your righteousness, same word that we've been talking about, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Which is a very strange thing to say because in this time and in this place, the most righteous people were the scribes and the Pharisees. I mean, they knew the scriptures backwards and forwards. They lived in almost perfect accordance with not even just the law, but the traditions that were built on the law to make sure you, not even, you didn't even get close to breaking the law. 
And so they were the celebrities, they were the superstars. People would walk around and say, wow, that's what it must look like to be holy. And so what was wrong with their righteousness that Christ says it's inadequate? Well, two things. The first one is that so much of that was for show. And the second thing was that they neglected the whole interpersonal aspect of the righteousness that God calls us to. And I want to prove that to you. This is Jesus' own words in Matthew 23, 23, which is always nice when it's the same number twice because it's easier to remember. Um, We've been talking about what blessing is. It means flourishing. It's an observation about uh, things go well spiritually for this person. The opposite of that is what's known as a woe. And this is Jesus speaking to this crowd, and he's saying, woe to you. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. What Jesus is saying here is that righteousness is both individual and interpersonal. And so think about it like this. I think that we could all agree that one of the worst things is not just a group project, but having a group grade for that project. I remember when I was in college that we had this group presentation that we had to do and we were getting a grade. The whole group got the same grade. And 30 minutes before we were supposed to go and present our project to the professor, it was discovered by me that one of our team members had plagiarized a full page and a half of their part of the presentation. And so what we decided to do is we spent the next 30 minutes trying to fix that and correct that and make it salvageable because we were good people No. Because we cared a lot about the topic? No. But because our grade was on the line as well, we felt a responsibility because it was about the group as opposed to just the individual. And in the same way, when Christ is talking about blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, he's not saying blessed are those who hunger and thirst only for their own individual righteousness, but he's saying also the righteousness of those around them. It's not just individual, it's interpersonal. And that's hard, right? That's not natural. It's not easy. So many of us were kind of uh, born with a disposition towards maybe, maybe our own. We want to spend time with God. We want to just be alone with God. Others of us, we can just look at society and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is how we could fix it. We're geared maybe in one of those two ways. And it's hard to start to balance ourselves out with the other side. And then you've got experiences and culture and upbringing that all complicate this entire thing. This is really, really difficult to do. So why should we do it? Talk about how we live in line with God's view of how the world should work. Why why should we? Right? If it doesn't affect our salvation, then why, why should we go through the effort and the energy and the expense of living individually righteous as well as interpersonally? And there's, two, there's many reasons, but the two that I'll tell you, one is from the past and one is from the future. Uh, the one from the past is essentially the fact of what Jesus has done for us. It's the gospel. The gospel should motivate us to desire righteousness, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, one of my favorite passages says that Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we would die to sin and live to righteousness. We're not born righteous. I know that's not a popular idea. And we're also not able to make ourselves righteousness by good works. I know that's not very popular either, but that's what the Bible communicates. That's what being poor in spirit needs us to acknowledge. Isaiah chapter 64 says that even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. They're great for society, but they can't fix what's wrong in our relationship with God. I was thinking about this the other day because I had this really cool moment where uh, a household appliance taught me about the gospel that I wanted to share with you. Um, We had taco night, and I've got three kids now, so sometimes, I'd say a lot of times, the dishes don't get done the night of, so they just kind of compile in the sink. And we had people who were coming over to hang out with us, and so we got to run a quick load on, in the dishwasher and get that stuff cleaned out. And in my haste, I just threw one of the, uh, the containers in there that had a Tupperware with all the old stuff from taco night, the, the old meat, the old cheese, the old sour cream just kind of packed in there. I just threw that into the dishwasher, not realizing that the lid wasn't taken off. 
And then with everything else, I ran the cycle, and when I came out, I was looking at it, and it was teaching me about the gospel because the unclean part of that Tupperware container was the inside, and I washed the outside really, really well, but it didn't change what was actually unclean about that item. And in the same way, our righteous deeds, as good as they may be for outside, they do nothing to fix what is broken inside, and that's why we need a savior. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says that God made him, Christ, who knew no sin was perfectly righteous, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's a gift. That is a gift to go from an enemy, to go from an adversary, to forgiven and free, but it's even more than that. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold, look, marvel, be astonished, be astounded what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we would be called children of God. What reason could we have to not want to live for him and live like him in light of a gift like that? Somebody does something like that for you and for me, leaves heaven to come here, live a righteous life, and make a trade with me? Not because I deserved it, but because he loved me? Why would I not want to live my life honoring him in everything that I do? Righteousness individually, yes. Righteous interpersonally, of course. Why would I not? The first reason why we do the hard work of living righteously is because of what Christ did for us on the cross. That's the past. But there's also the future. This passage says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. They will be filled. When I hear that word filled or satisfied, I think about Thanksgiving. Um, I don't know about you, I like to kind of save up my hunger for dinner time. And so I don't, I don't burn out on breakfast or, or lunch, even though there's snacks all over the place. What I like to do is I like to wait really for dinner and dessert. You know, you got the, the mashed potatoes and, and you got the stuffing and, and the turkey. I almost just said chicken. You have the turkey. Um, and then you get to dessert and you get to the, you know, the rainbow cookies and the, the marzipan. And then you get the Italian cookies with the powdered sugar and the, the jelly in between there, the raspberry jelly. I'm sure some of you are actually kind of hungry right now. You know, all the things that we do in honor of the pilgrims who didn't believe in holidays and would probably be revolted at our gluttony. Um, all of those things, and, and at that moment, that after you're finished, you put down that last rainbow cookie, and you just sit back in your chair, and you're thinking, where are my sweatpants? <laughs> because I never need to eat again. I am completely satisfied. I am stuffed. I am filled. That that's going to be our experience with righteousness in the age to come. Like, if you're like me, maybe you have a couple of uh, moments throughout a day that were like, those were good moments. Like, I, I think I was righteous in those few moments. But they're more the exception a lot of times than they are the rule. But imagine a, an existence where unceasingly you were living righteously, where it was your default nature of your heart, your soul, and your mind. That's fantastic. Imagine a, a, a community, a society where justice would roll down like waters and righteousness flow like an ever-flowing stream. You know, every, every funeral that I do now, every pastoral counseling session that I have with a couple on the brink of divorce, every time I watch the news and my heart just breaks for what I see, I find my desire for this age to come increasing dreaming about a time where there's, there's no more pandemics and there's no more prisons. There's no more elections, no more inequality. There's no more racism. There's no more regret. That all you've got is love and justice and peace and reconciliation where all the graves have been turned into gardens. I can't wait for that and that God would offer that to us. Like you think about how gracious he would be to just give us salvation and just say, enjoy your life, at least we're on good terms. Like that would be gift enough. But to promise us an abundant life, 
a life that flourishes when we follow in the footsteps of Christ, but then to give us eternity tacked on to that, and not eternity in a broken society again, but eternity in paradise, in perfection, where our deepest desires for individual and interpersonal righteousness are satisfied. Are you kidding me that this is what we get? Why would we not want to live for that person? Why would we not want to live for God, live like him, do everything that we can to honor him? And so that's our heart, that's our desire. The question becomes then, how do we do it? I think it's helpful sometimes to think about how we would approach nutrition, right? Like if we're hungering and thirsting for the wrong things, how do we start hungering and thirsting for the right things? And I think that if we were to break it into three categories, we would say that there's some foods that you just gotta stop eating. There's some foods that you have to moderate or, or fast even, and then there's other things that you can just indulge away. I'm still working on what falls in what category in my own life. But as far as it relates to spiritually speaking, I think there are some things that we need to just quit. And by quit, I mean we need to repent of and, and to turn away from and just say, this just doesn't belong in the Christian life. And so I just need to get it out of my life, God. I, I need to stop doing it. I need to stop hungering and desiring. I need to stop snacking on this stuff. I just need, I need it gone. And there's a long list of things, but for the sake of time, I'll just give two. The first one would be hungering for knowledge of God without obedience to God. That's something we have to quit. We have to get out of our lives. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, if I know all mysteries and I have all knowledge and I've got so much faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I don't have action, I don't have the implementation of that knowledge, I'm nothing. And what I see sometimes within Christian circles is this kind of bravado about how much we know as opposed to how much we actually live out. The first thing we need to quit is knowledge, a desire for knowledge without obedience. The second thing is overlooking the Imago Dei. The Imago Dei is this Latin term means the image of God and, and every person is made in God's image regardless of how they vote, regardless of their choices in life, regardless of how they believe about certain issues. They're still the image of God, and we live in a culture that would try and constantly say, these people are the good people who are valuable and are worth something to society, and these people are not. And depending on which stations you watch, they've got different definitions of who falls into what category. And we could get sucked into that and start to believe that because somebody votes a certain way or dresses a certain way or advocates for certain things that they are not the Imago Dei when they are. There's one thing the church really needs to start practicing. It is that we believe in the Imago Dei, the image of God, that every person, regardless of what they do or what they say, is still an image bearer of the God that we worship. So we've got to quit overlooking that and we've got to quit hungering for knowledge that doesn't translate into action. Those are two things that we need to quit. What's one thing that we should fast? I think that we really have to start fasting media. I mean the whole term, just the, the entirety of content and information and everything that's coming to us, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, because media does so much to exacerbate these two cravings. You watch the media, you watch the news, and it'll, it'll demonize people on the other side. And, and before you know it, unless you're active about it, unless you're kind of taking a step back every now and again and being like, is, is this the, the news station that I'm watching? Is this, the, is this the people that I'm following on social media, or, or is this righteous? I don't want any of us to get discipled by people who aren't disciples of Christ. And then in terms of hungering and thirsting for knowledge that doesn't actually lead to transformation and obedience, like, Thank God that we have such incredible resources on the internet where you can learn more as a Christian today than you ever could in the entirety of church history. That is amazing. But there's always another video to watch. There's always something else to consume, another article to read, another sermon to listen to. And if we're not careful, if we don't occasionally take a step back, we can become professional learners who never actually implement what it is that they're learning and slowly start to feel superior and higher and mightier than the people around us. So every now and again, we need to maybe to have some moderation with media, maybe put the phone down, set it in airplane mode, maybe take a little bit of a break if we really want to be righteous. And then when it comes to indulge, we're gonna unpack a lot of this over the next couple of uh, weeks, but 
If I could just give you one thing that I think we can indulge in together, it would be to, to pray the hour. In Matthew 6, Christ is giving the template for the model prayer. He says, pray then in this way, our Father in heaven. How often are my prayers just about me and the people in my immediate vicinity, the people that I like, the people that I agree with? What if I was praying for people beyond that circle? How might things change? How might I be a better practitioner of the righteousness that God calls us to if I was praying for the people who disagree, to give them their daily bread, to forgive them their debts, to deliver them from evil, to lead them not into temptation? What if I was taking the us's that are in the Our Father, the model prayer has this huge interpersonal aspect to it. What if I started doing that and praying for the people around me? God, change my heart, break my heart for what breaks yours. I think that would help all of us to live a life more in line with God's view on how the world should work. We named the series the way we did because it is a question that is thrown out to all of us. To be or not to be like Jesus, we all have that choice. To be or not to be, we have the choice whether we really truly want to hunger and thirst for righteousness like we talked about today or not. If we don't hunger and thirst for righteousness, what, what happens is that we just wander from concession stand to concession stand looking for satisfaction that is not there. But if we say yes, if we're willing to do the hard work of hungering and thirsting for interpersonal and individual righteousness, then we get to experience the abundant life that Christ came here to give us. We get to experience what it's like to flourish. We get to be the city on a hill that Christ talks about in Matthew 5. We get to be the salt of the earth. We get to be the light of the world. And if we did that, collectively, if we agreed to do that, then what would happen? is as we embrace and as we consider and as we interpret and apply all of these things to our lives and we obey the call of God to righteousness, then the world around us, the broken, crazy world around us, might just start to listen to God's call of salvation. Let me pray. Jesus, you said that you are the bread of life. Whoever comes to you would never hunger and whoever believes in you would never thirst. And so we come before you today wanting to quit of some things, wanting to quit feeling superior and forgetting that everybody's made in God's image. We wanna quit the desire for knowledge that doesn't actually get used in our lives. We come to you asking for help with strength and, and with energy and with focus to remain balanced on the righteousness, so that way we don't tip to one side or to the other, but that we continually strive to practice both. We come to you today looking for help to truly embrace and believe that thy will be done. Your kingdom is better than ours. God, we come to you today for help seeking your kingdom and your righteousness above our own. And so, Lord, that is our prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.